Okay, so no advertisement. <laughs> so our next talk <laughs> is um, uh, Pierre Clisson. I think I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yeah. It's a topic I always wanted to get into, but never had the opportunity. Um, it's about um, this brain computer interfaces, something very interesting. So welcome, Pierre. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, and you? Perfectly fine. So where are you streaming from? I'm in Paris, France. Ah, very nice. So not that far from me too. I'm from Basel, Switzerland. So um, yeah, in another time, it would be just a train ride, and today is more <laughs> complicated. So OK, so let's get started. OK, so as you know, the field of uh, brain-computer interfaces has attracted quite a bit of attention recently from uh, the media. And uh, beyond the hype, uh, I would like to show you how you can achieve state-of-the-art results today without having any surgery. Um, first, uh, we will get just enough uh, theory to know what are BCIs and how they work. Next, we will briefly review the kind of hardware you need to build your own BCI. We will then introduce TimeFlux, an open source Python framework for designing BCIs. And finally, we will look at a practical example of an actual BCI along with demo and code. So let's get started. A brand computer interface lets you interact with the physical world using your mind only. So this is a very generic, broad definition of BCIs. And I'd like to show you a few examples. So what can you do with BCIs? First, you can help uh, disabled people to move and to communicate. You can learn to control a wheelchair or a robotic arm with uh, your brain. We can uh, develop software to help us uh, spell words with your mind only. And uh, we have something called neuro rehabilitation. So in that case, we ask patients uh, who have uh, suffered from a stroke to imagine a hand or a foot movement. And if we can detect uh, the correct pattern in the brain, we show the movement or we show feedback on the screen or in uh, virtual reality. The goal is to help people with uh, neural uh, plasticity and to help people recover usage of their limbs after a stroke. There are other usage. For example, we can detect if a driver is uh, getting sleepy. So we can detect the vigilance level, or we can train for meditation, for instance. This is something that we call uh, neurofeedback. And obviously, we can just have fun. So we can include emotion detection in games, or we can decide to fly a drone with our mind. So these are just a few examples. And uh, now this is the general principle of a BCI. This is the general print, uh, process we follow when we design uh, a brain computer interface. So first, in the signal, signal acquisition step, we generally use an EEG headset to measure brain activity. Of course, we can have a much better signal by implanting electrodes directly inside the skull, but you know, I already said we won't have surgery today. Um, then we have the signal processing step. We generally have to filter the signal to reduce the noise, muscle artifact, um, electric noise, and so on. We can also apply more advanced algorithms uh, to increase uh, the signal to noise uh, ratio. Then in the feature extraction step, we are entering the machine learning realm. And this is where we, uh, we divide the raw signal into small chunks of data called epochs. 
and where we extract meaningful information from these epochs. Then in the pattern recognition step, we train a machine learning model. And depending on the application, it can be a classification or a regression model. And finally, in brain computer interface, there is interface. And this is where we output the resulting prediction we made, and which will allow us to control an external device, for example, a wheelchair, or to pre provide feedback to the user through uh, sound or images, for instance. So going back to the signal acquisition phase, how does an EEG work? First, an EEG stands for electroencephalogram. It's a recording of the electrical activity of the brain using electrodes placed on the scalp. So the brain is made up of cells called neurons. These neurons communicate using chemical messages. And these chemical messages change the electrical potential of the cells they connect with. So in a way, uh, neurons can be seen as tiny electric dipoles, just like very small batteries. And these changes in electrical potential create a very small electrical field. It is so small, it is impossible to measure the electrical activity of one individual neuron through the scalp. But if a lot of these neurons are aligned and are activated at the same time, the electrical field becomes large enough and we can measure it. So an EEG signal is made up of many independent measures. And this is a time series. And the formal definition of a time series is a series of data points indexed in time orders. So in time flux, we use uh, pandas to represent this uh, time series. As you can see on the left, we have a time index and we have four electrodes. And on the right, we just plotted these uh, four uh, channels of data. We have uh, four electrodes, the time. And uh, here, we can see we measure the electrical activity in microvolt. So it's a very small unit. So now that we get, now that we have this EEG signal, this time series, how do we process it? How do we uh, classify the signal? So there are two main ways, depending on the paradigm, on the application, to process the EEG signal. And the first one is in the frequency domain. You have uh, probably heard about brain waves before. And these are neural oscillations in specific uh, frequency ranges. And we classify these uh, uh, brain waves into five uh, main categories. There are others, of course. And uh, broadly, they correspond to uh, different uh, state of, states of, of mind or attention or drowsiness, or, uh, etc. Another way is to observe how the raw EEG signal changes during specific conditions. When we do this, we operate in the time domain. So for instance, here we have a stimulus at time zero. And we can see that, that just after the stimulus, we have a specific pattern here. This specific pattern is called the P300 because the, uh, we have a, we're starting to, uh, to see a lot of activity after 300 milliseconds. And we can detect these uh, patterns in the brain. So what do you need to acquire this data? So you need an EEG system. And there are 
two components in an energy system. First, you need electrodes, which are connected to the scalp. And you need an amplifier to digitalize the electrical signal. First, the amplifier. So there are many uh, brands uh, doing EEG. So on one side, you have uh, research grade, very good quality, but very expensive um, EEG amplifiers. So on the left here, we have a Biosemi, which is a really, really good uh, amplifier, but very, very expensive. On the right, we have an open source uh, DYI uh, amplifier. This one, this specific one is uh, Hack EEG from Starcat, but you may also have heard about uh, OpenBCI, uh, which is uh, very popular. And then we need electrodes. So on the left, we have the gold standard for EEG research. It's um, electrode cap. So we put we have to put gel into uh, the holes so it can be messy. It uh, requires about uh, 15 to 20 minutes when you're experienced to, to set up everything. But it's uh, really top-notch quality and uh, this is really the gold standard. On the other hand, you have uh, 3D printed uh, DYI dry electrode solutions, uh, such as this one from OpenBCI. It's fully 3D printed. And the signal quality is not as good, but you can start to, to play with it. And finally, we have a third category, and we have what is called consumer grade EEG. And this include the amplifier and the electrodes together into one small form factor. So on the left here, you have a very popular uh, solution for neurofeedback, which is called the Muse. Here it's the Muse S. On the right, it's uh, the Neurosity Crown. And they have dry electrodes, uh, limited coverage of the scalp. So it's good for uh, basic neurofeedback, but you can't really use it for advanced uh, BCI. Uh, so we try to bring the best of both worlds. So this is a project we are um, working on and we expect to launch in the upcoming weeks or months. And this is a high performance research grade EEG, which is suitable for advanced applications such as BCI, but with an affordable price. So please register your email and you uh, get a notification when it's uh, ready. So we'll talk about, uh, we've uh, talked about uh, the theory, the hardware. Now we need to talk about the software. Timeflux is an open source Python framework for the acquisition and real-time processing of biosignals. So it runs on Linux, macOS, and Windows, which was not really an easy task, considering that uh, there are a lot of um, uh, multi-processing, multi-threading issues, and uh, Windows is not a POSIX system anyway. Uh, so it's working. And um, so what can you use Timeflux for? You can use it to acquire data and with synchronized events from multiple sources. You can use it for uh, presenting stimulus, stimuli to, to the users, to build biofeedback or neurofeedback applications, obviously to, to build brand computer interfaces, to make interactive installations, etc. The important thing to remember is that Timeflux is not only about EEG data, it's even not only about uh, biosignals, but it's compatible with many kinds of time series. Timeflux works with 
many devices out of the box. So we have native support for uh, many devices, including OpenBCI, HackEEG, uh, Vitalino, but also commercial research-grade EEG system, such as uh, ANT Neuro on the right. And also, uh, we can support other devices, uh, such as eye trackers or uh, multimodal uh, biofeedback systems, or even force platform, which are uh, basically um, balance on steroids. And we also uh, support the lab streaming layer uh, networking protocol. And with this, you can access tens of uh, devices out of the box. So why did we build uh, TimeFlux in the first place? First, we wanted something that fits well within the Python data science ecosystem. I wanted something with a permissive MIT license, something that I can use in a commercial settings also, and something that works both offline and online. Uh, so in the BCI jargon, online just means uh, real time. So what I mean here, here is that you can use time flux both in real time, but also you can use it in um, Jupyter notebook, for instance. And I wanted uh, something that allows me to quickly prototype, to quickly test new IDs without having to go deep into C++, etc. So TimeFlux is easy to learn, it's easy to use, easy to extend. Um, most of you are familiar with graphs. If you are not, it's uh, really easy to learn um, some basic graph theory. It relies on industry standards, Pandas for 2D data, XRF for multidimensional da data, scikit-learn for machine learning, LSL. So if you have already done some basic data science, you can reuse your, uh, your skills here. And there is nothing new. It's uh, the tools you already know. And if you're not a coder, it's not a problem. Um, because many uh, pipelines, many processing pipelines, can just be described using a simple YAML uh, syntax. And if you want to go further, further if you need to uh, have a special, uh, if you have a special use case, etc., you can build your own uh, custom node, and it's just a standard Python class with one method to extend. So we try to have a good documentation. Uh, it's not perfect yet, but we are going to this direction. So uh, we have a full uh, tutorial on the documentation website. Uh, if you spend 30 minutes, half an hour uh, following the steps, etc., you will uh, uh, get uh, the, the main principles of time flux. We have some examples. And we also try to uh, document uh, the API uh, extensively with uh, example and illustrations. So TimeFlux comes with everything you need to get started, uh, including multiple networking uh, protocol tools. Uh, we use the publish subscribe protocol, which we built on top of uh, ZeroMQ. Uh, the lab streaming layer protocol, which is very popular in uh, neuroscience, the OSC protocol, to, which is a UDP protocol to communicate uh, with multimedia application, WebSockets to do things in a web browser. And we can record and replay data and events in the HDF5 file format. Uh, we obviously have uh, all you need to uh, to do uh, DSP, machine learning, obviously, and we provide tools uh, to build a user interface. And we included a few uh, basic um, applications with uh, the, the code. We have a monitoring interface to, to check the signal and some uh, web applications, demo applications. We also have 
or you need to do uh, multi-dimensional matrix manipulation in real time. You can query, uh, run some expressions, epoch the data, uh, run uh, some um, windows on the data, et cetera, et cetera. We already mentioned that we have um, multiple native device drivers. We can uh, have a very precise synchronization between the stimuli and the EEG data, which is something which is very, very important when you do uh, neuroscience and ERP research, um, EEG research. And if something goes wrong, we have debugging tools. Uh, if uh, you, you know precisely um, in your YAML file where you have uh, made a mistake or uh, you can um, output your uh, graph into a visual way also. And you can uh, plug some other application through hooks. For instance, uh, you may want to uh, upload your uh, data file on the cloud just after uh, your acquisition. So you will write a very simple Python module, and you will just hook to uh, the Tenflux hook for that. So I already mentioned um, that many um, applications that you can make with Timeflux run in a web browser, but they don't have to. And uh, you can use any networking protocol available. You can even design your own networking protocol. And you can plug it with anything you want. You may decide to. Um, design a game in Unity, for instance. Uh, so you can use uh, Timeflux as a backend and um, Unity as the front end to play your game in 3D. Or in this case, we use uh, the WebSocket protocol and we have a few um, application here. So on the left, we can see the raw signals, the raw EG signal. Um, here on the middle, it's um, P300 spiller, I will get into more details later. And on the right is just a basic example of showing uh, the signal quality of uh, each electrode. So how do you design a processing pipeline? There is one essential concept and it's called directed acyclic graph. And this is something you learn uh, in uh, computer science. But uh, in uh, just a few words, a DAG is a set of nodes connected by edges where information flows in a given direction without any loop. And so each node here is a processing unit. And edges are where the information flows. And at the junction, at the nodes and edges, we have what we call ports. So a node can have multiple ports, so multiple output or multiple inputs. And these um, inputs and outputs are Generally, they are an object, and this object contains a data frame and some uh, metadata to describe the data frame. So remember, uh, earlier I talked about the closed loop uh, system. So how is this uh, DAG, which doesn't have any loop, how can it be compatible with uh, the closed loop system we talked earlier? Well, it's simple. We can just have multiple DAGs and make them communicate in an asynchronous way. So the important thing to remember here is that each graph run in parallel in its own process. And each node in a graph run in a sequential way. So when 
one graph wants to communicate with another it will uh, one node will publish information to a broker and the broker will store the data for a while and when the graph the other graph need this uh, information it will text it from the broker so this is how we can have uh, loops without uh, breaking anything so enough theory how do you uh, represent this uh, graph in practice so this is a very a simple example, it's a hello world of uh, time flux. Very simple uh, graph, one graph, four nodes. We have one uh, node which uh, generate random data here. In practice, you can imagine that uh, this node will get uh, data from an EEG system. One node uh, that will display data on the console, another node uh, which will add value to this um, matrix, matrix and then display also the value. So here we have a simple YAML uh, object. Um, so we describe our nodes. So we have one, two, three, four nodes, or random nodes, uh, the display before, display after node. And the add nodes, as you can see, can take uh, arguments. Here we decide we will add one to each value of um, at each cell in the random uh, matrix. And then we need to connect these nodes together. So we connect the random port to the add port. We connect the random port to the display before port, and we connect the add port to the display after port. And that's it. And this is how you describe a processing pipelines. Of course, uh, there are subtleties. You can, uh, because uh, each node can have uh, multiple ports, dynamic ports. Uh, so we can extend a little bit uh, the syntax, but basically, this is it. Um, an important thing to know also is that each graph will have a rate and this rate will determine how many times per second the graph will run so with a rate of one the whole graph will run one time per second if you uh, put 20 here um, the the graph will run at 20 hertz that means 20 times per second Okay, so what about custom nodes? What if I want to uh, develop my own node, my own logic? Well, again, it's simple. It's, it's just a class that you extend. And this has an optional uh, constructor where you can pass parameters as you have uh, seen before in the YAML uh, syntax. And you have just one method to extend, and this method is the update function, which is called each time the graph is updated. And you can you get the, the input in uh, one uh, value and you can set the uh, output and time flux will take care of everything else to connect and pass the value uh, uh, by itself and so this is a very basic example this is our um, add nodes we described earlier so the, in the, the constructor we store the the, the value we we want to to add and then in the update we just copy the input to the output and we add our value to each cell of the output. It's just as simple. Um, okay, so there are multiple uh, different kind of ports. I won't go into details uh, right now. Uh, okay, 
So we have uh, plugins. Plugins are a collection of nodes. It's uh, just standard Python packages, nothing exotic here. You can um, just uh, clone, uh, use um, the, the template on GitHub, and it's really easy. If you want to learn more, we have the uh, documentation website. I think I need to accelerate just a little bit. And you know, in interfaces, in a web, in the brand computer interfaces, we have interfaces. So in TimeFlux, we provide a JavaScript API, uh, which allows you to build user interfaces available from a web browser, to receive and to send data streams and events, and to deliver precisely scheduled stimuli. Uh, which are suitable for advanced uh, EG research, such as uh, SSVP or ERP. Um, it's not easy. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things going on in the browser. There is a, the dump painting, the JavaScript event loop, the screen refresh, uh, refresh rate, the Spectre meltdown, the security countermeasure, there are even bugs in Chrome's. Um, so it's not easy, but we did our best to make it easy to use. And you can schedule repeating stimuli or one-time task, and you know exactly when the stimulus has been displayed. It's well tested in Chrome, and probably it works in other browsers, but it's not as well uh, tested. We went to considerable length to ensure that our signal is well uh, synchronized. So we fastened um, LED on the screen, and we uh, checked if it was uh, synchronized with uh, the events, etc. cetera. Um, OK, I won't spend too much time on this. And then we ran a standard um, neuroscience experiment uh, called uh, the oddball experiment. And basically, you display boring uh, stimulus, repeating stimulus. And from time to time, out of the blue, there is a deviant stimulus, uh, a light or a sound. And we have this pattern when something goes out of the ordinary. We can detect this pattern. And to be able to detect this pattern, we need to average a lot of epochs together. And uh, here we can see that we have a different pattern in the deviant case. And um, this is something you can't have, you can't see if you don't have very pre precise uh, synchronization between the events and uh, the data. We went a little bit further, and we tried to uh, classify single trial ERP using uh, different machine learning algorithms, and we were able to, to have a very high scoring. And so it works uh, quite well. Um, but OK, so now let's build the BCI. And what I'd like to show you today is how to build a P300 speller, how to um, type with your mind. So let me show you a quick video before. Uh, I will, uh, OK, so this is uh, on the left, you have time flux. On the right, this is the monitoring interface. I will go faster. So, oops. So this is my EG signals with eight electrodes, and you see this is the value in a microvolt. Okay, something really interesting is happening here. You can see these uh, little waves here. These little waves are um, alpha waves. You can really see them on the screen. And as you can see, it's also very, uh, the signal is very sensitive to noise. You see this big spike here? It's when I blink. So the EG was able to capture also muscle uh, activity. So then, you know, in machine learning, we need to train the model. 
to calibrate something, and then we are able to make some predictions. So how does it work? First, we ask the subject, we ask the, the participant to focus on a character. Here, focus on the T. OK, now it's I. And uh, each time the character I is flashing, we can detect uh, there is a specific pattern in the brain. And if we also put this uh, nice uh, smiley face, it's uh, because humans are hardwired to recognize faces. So uh, it's easier for us to detect a pattern because we have both the recognition of the character and the recognition of the face. So we have different groups of character and we record uh, the signals along with the events. And then we know when a character has been flashed and when it has not been flashed. And from then, we are able to uh, train a model. I will go forward. OK, the model is fitting. It takes a few seconds. And it's OK. So now we are ready to, to, uh, to enter the prediction mode. And I will look at a specific character. And after a while, the system detects which character I was looking at just because it recognized when um, uh, when uh, it was flashing and when it, there was a face. OK, let's go forward. And I was able to uh, spell hello world. How cool is that? OK, so in practice, in practice, how does it work? Uh, there is a GitHub repo. I will give you uh, the URL in a while. Uh, you have all the code. All you need to do it yourself. And so remember, this is the, the full graph of the application. Uh, OK, I don't have that much time, but um, Anyway, so here we have three, four, five graphs. We have the acquisition graph, which is uh, responsible to get the data from the EEG to um, have some um, basic filtering, uh, signal processing. It sends the data to a proxy, a broker. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, the user interface, which uh, gets events which sends events through the classifier, but which also received prediction from the classifier. We have a basic uh, record node to save the data in a file. And this is the most important um, graph in the application. It's uh, the classification graph, which received uh, data and events. It then uh, divides the data into small epochs, trim the data so to make sure that we have the same number of, um, of uh, events in each um, data points. We have the same, sorry, uh, to ensure that we have a good, the same number of data points into each epoch. And then we pass this to a classification uh, pipeline, circuit learn classification pipeline where and then we pass this uh, all this prediction to a, to a prediction node because we, it's very difficult to, to be able to make uh, one prediction with only one flash. So we need to accumulate a few uh, predictions. And then we apply some Bayesian logic to be able to make a prediction with confidence. And uh, OK, and the full YAML file is described here. So here we have the classification graph. And maybe this one is of a particular interest. It's the classification um, 
nodes. And maybe you are able here to recognize uh, these steps are a ba basic scikit-learn pipeline. So here we have uh, two transformers and uh, classifiers. And uh, so first we need to transpose the data so it's in the correct shape for the PyRiman um, algorithm, which is a state-of-the-art um, algorithm for classification in, uh, in BCI. It's available on, on PyPy, so I encourage you to, to check it. And uh, yeah, so, and then the PyRiman is also re responsible for classification. So we have the first transformer, and then we have a classification. OK, so here we have custom node. And here we have the JavaScript and HTML for the code. I tried to comment it as well as I can, I could. So please have a look at the code. And if you have any question, uh, please uh, reach us. Uh, uh, we have only one demo for now. More are coming. So we have all the pipelines with the standard BCI cardings for SSVP, CVAP, P300, motor imagery, uh, neurofeedback, and but also uh, for cardiac and uh, EMG, well, you know, gesture detection. Another thing which is coming is a hub. Um, everything bundled into one single application where there is nothing to install because you are developers, but uh, uh, you know neuroscientists uh, sometimes get lost with um, Python dependencies, etc. And it includes a graphical user interface and something to easily launch and monitor applications. And we barely scratched uh, the surface here. We, there, there is a lot of more to, to know and to learn. Uh, and please don't hesitate to, to reach for us. Um, First, please uh, register your email on the website. Uh, I promise we won't spam you, It's uh, but we will send you information when we run workshops or uh, events, hackathons, and these kind of things. Uh, I encourage you to check the documentation and tutorials, to report bugs on GitHub, uh, and join the Slack channel if you have any question. And if you are a startup or a company and you need uh, consulting services, please contact me by email. So this is the uh, address of uh, the repository. And you know, uh, maintaining such a project takes a considerable amount of time and energy. So please play the social game. Give us a star on GitHub. Uh, you can even sponsor the project if you want. If you like it, talk about time flux around you. If you use it, let us know. Thank you. I'll take any question if there are any. Thank you very much. Very nice project. I really like this concept with the YAML files and the graph. That's really, really great stuff. So there is a First question, it's more about the hardware. What's the approximate price range for those consumer EEG hardware? And what about the professional ones? OK. So uh, if you want to have a full set uh, in uh, uh, open hardware, uh, you have to get around 1,000 uh, or 1,500 uh, euros. Uh, the really professional one, research grade, can be like 30, 40,000 euros. But uh, to be able to really start to play with uh, um, BCIs, we need, you need to, to spend at least uh, 1,000 euros. OK, and does, that is just uh, EEG. What about the eye tracker? That's, I guess, even more expensive. Uh, yeah, but you don't really need uh, an eye tracker, of course. Yeah. Okay, yeah. usually, yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, so um, at the moment, I don't see any more questions. And anyways, we are running 
out of time, so we don't really have time anymore before the uh, next break. Um, I think there is a break now. Is this correct? Yeah, the coffee break is starting now. So thank you very much again, Pierre. Thanks, Martin. And see you around virtually. Okay, my pleasure. Bye. Bye bye.